Welcome everyone to the Inclusive Design in Africa webinar series. And today's topic is why equal access is imperative and how we can achieve it. Before we start off, I want to mention that we've made every effort to make this webinar accessible. We have captions, we have sign language interpreters, and we also have a, a question and answer box where you can send your questions. So today's agenda, um, we're going to start off with welcome and introduction remarks. We'll have a presentation from our speakers and then we'll wrap up with question and answers from our participants. So my name is Irene Barikureka, the founder and executive director of Enable, a nonprofit organization based in Nairobi, Kenya and Washington, DC, with a very simple mission to empower the blind and visually impaired in Africa through computer assistive technology. So accessibility is at the heart of what we do. We are very grateful to Google for supporting today's inclusive design webinar. Please join me in welcoming Christopher Patno. He leads Google's efforts around the accessibility of products he will share with us how Google makes its products accessible. Over to you, Christopher. Thank you, Irene. Um, Habari yero, jine langu ni Christopher. And I, I hope I didn't massacre that. Um, <laughs> I wanted you did to, a great job. <laughs> thank you. Um, I want to thank Irene and, and everyone in terms of Inclusive, Inclusive Africa for putting together this webinar. I'm really excited to be part of this and thank you for giving us the opportunity. I'll give the real comments later, but just to get to one minute about Google and our, our, our accessibility journey as a company. Um, Google's mission is to make the world's information universally accessible and useful. So accessibility is actually built into the mission statement. And but it doesn't make it doesn't make it easy, it doesn't make it automatic. Um, we had a best effort process for many, many years, but about eight years ago, we realized that we needed the attention to make it real, to make it last, to make it strong and to make it complete. So today we now have CEO level support where we had 10 minutes of our, our Google IO last year was spent on accessibility technologies. And we even had Sundar, our CEO, speak to our accessibility week for the first time last fall. So one takeaway I want you to realize is that it takes time. Second thing that changed is the intention because we have the intention to make it happen, we were able to bring the fire of it to, it to accessibility. And now it's organized with a shared responsibility across the company. Within Google, accessibility is sort of a hub and spoke model. There's a central hub that I'm part of that sort of sets the tone, sets the, the expectations and requirements. And then we teach the, the, the community around us and the, the engineering teams around us so that each what we call product areas like Chrome or Search or Android they have their own sense of expertise and we help teach them about accessibility that they take it off and do better than we ever could. Part of that teaching is also bringing everybody around us to the same level. So we have internally what's called a dojo program where we teach each other, what does it mean to do it to be accessible? So we have an engineering path, we have a design path, we have a testing path, and each of these has this progression that allows people to learn themselves and then teach each other. And then finally, what you need to do is once you have a language of accessibility, then you need to be able to speak this language to leaders and get them to buy in and get them to believe is important. And I think this is something we'll, we'll hear more from from Bama shortly, but it, the, the takeaway here is no matter how passionate you are, no matter how, how, how much you want to make it happen, you can't do it yourself. You have to bring people to you and then bring everyone together up and around you. So the three takeaways, it takes time, you need to do it with, with intention and you can't do it yourself. And I think I'll save the rest of my comments for my, my chat a little bit later. Thank you. Thank you so much, Christopher. And thanks for emphasizing that inclusive, um, inclusive design or accessibility is really for, uh, for everyone. So today we have some amazing, amazing speakers and some of the world's leading accessibility and inclusive design experts. I will give them a chance to quickly introduce themselves and I'll uh, hand over to Rama. 
Uh, hi there, um, everyone. I can't see you, but I can feel you. Um, it, I can feel this is a very accessible and empathic crowd. So my name is Rama Garawo. I am the director of the Helen Hamlin Centre for Design in London at the Royal College of Art. I'll be introducing the centre and the college within my talk, but just a few words about myself. Um, it's sort of good news. I wanted to be a designer when, since I was 14. Then it was bad news that when I was 19, I got disillusioned. Um, and then, but the good news again is when I discovered inclusive design accessibility, I was all in. So um, uh, uh, inclusive design is a great passion for me. I've worked in um, a number of different sectors and I wouldn't be doing anything else on the planet. Mm. And right now, I don't want to be doing anything else other than talking to you. Thank you so much, Rama. Um, next, we're going to have Bernard. Um, hello. Uh, uh, I hope you, you can see me. So my name is Bernard Shira. Um, I work with the Global Disability Innovation Hub, and we are doing some amazing work. Uh, we believe it's quite innovative around uh, innovation for disability, specifically on assistive technology. So if you think of assistive technology, think of it as a tool that enables persons with disability to be at par with any other, or even surpass, uh, you know, people with no disabilities. And I, I lead some work here in Kenya called Innovate Now. And Innovate Now is, is about building an inclusive innovation ecosystem in Kenya. And we are uh, anchoring our work on assistive technology because we believe that, you know, it is that first step that allows persons with disability to come on the table at equal terms. So I'll be sharing more about my work and uh, my perspective on inclusion, uh, as, as specifically inclusive design from a very personal touch and also looking at some of the areas where I believe Africa needs to start looking at right now to become a more inclusive place. Thank you very much. Okay, next we are, I'm going to give Christopher just a chance to talk about himself. Uh, I'll talk about myself in, in, in my talk. Let's, I want to hear from Rama. Okay, all right. So then we will go ahead and kick off the discussion. I'm sure all the participants are eagerly waiting to learn more. So we'll start off with Rama and then we'll follow through with Christopher and finally Bernard will wrap it up. So Rama, over to you. Thank you. Um, I thought, uh, Christopher, you've heard enough about, heard enough from me over the, over the years, but here goes. Um, so um, just to introduce myself, my talk is called From Margins to Mainstream, Why We All Need to Think More Inclusively. And I, I think this is an incredibly timely moment uh, for this. We are talking about global issues, but within an African context. So Irene and Christopher um, um, have really asked me to set the context. What is inclusive design and why do we need it? Um, there are some uh, um, handles, some Twitter handles um, down there, um, uh, Instagram and Facebook, if you wish to say positive things or negative things about this talk. The Royal College of Art, um, our graduates have global influence. I don't know how many of you own a Bentley, a Jaguar, um, or a Rolls Royce, um, but also Toyota, Ford, Hyundai, Kia, Dyson, um, all are graduates of the college. Bottom right, you'll see um, an, a, a phone, which is, um, uh, sorry, Christopher, it's an Apple phone, but um, we also supply graduates to both Google and Apple. The Helen Hamlin Center for Design has done over 300 inclusive design projects with 180 organizations. Um, and you can see some of the tech companies that we've worked with on the far left-hand side of your screen. Inclusive design is at the heart of what we do. And um, I'm an active designer. I've always wanted to be a designer. And here you can see me on screen talking to a woman um, who uses a wheelchair called Fiona about the London taxi. 
and I'm not forcing her to give us insights. That's not a gun in my hand, that's a video camera. But there is a problem with design and how it's seen. Inclusive design has two words and one of them is design. So I can prove this problem with design. So if you take out your smartphone and type in the word designer on any texting application, this is what comes up. It's this, is, you know, this predictive icon. Does that describe designers? Are we French people from the 1940s with a paintbrush wearing berets? No, we're people of different shapes, sizes, needs, loves, lives. And this is what inclusive design is about. We talk about design centered around people or people centered design. The other word that we use is inclusive design. So inclusive design was defined by the center in 1994 and by the British government in 2000. Now the British government do get a couple of things wrong and I'm not gonna talk about them, um, but they got this right. They defined it as including the needs of the widest number of people in your design. And who doesn't want that? The inclusive design is creativity as it, at its most powerful and conscious. And everyone is creative, it's not just designers. It's also the most enabled and enabling form of design and creativity. And at the heart of it is accessibility. I see someone has a dog that's agreeing with me. <laughs> Inclusive design has a global context and can have universal impact. We're at a time in the world where things can feel quite dark. Oops. Let me just go back. Sorry, we're doing something on accessible technology and I've lost control of the tech. <laughs> there we are. <laughs> the, um, the dark only truly helps you appreciate the light and it may feel like dark times, but I think Issues have come to the fore that um, inclusive can, can design can help us uh, address. The pandemic has brought issues of exclusion into all of our lives. We all thought that aging would happen happens to someone else. It doesn't happen to me. But one thing I can guarantee is you're all aging right now as we speak. We all think that disability is probably someone else's issue, but who would want to drive that thing around all day or wake up next to a set of bars that make your bed look like a prison? Issues of accessibility, of inclusive design are now mainstream. We all have reduced access and ability and reduced choice. Inclusive design is about choice. It's about giving choice. And at this point in time, we need it more than ever. The other thing is we're also more reliant on technology than ever. We all believed in a pre-COVID world. About, um, we believed a wonderful nonsense. Maybe like the peacock on the left, it was about looking good, rather than the chicken on the, on the right who strapped some rockets to her back and is doing good. So we need to move beyond that. We need inclusive design for people of all ages, abilities, cultures, and globally. Inclusive design is the creative power to improve life. I'm gonna take you through some quick fire presentations, quick fire slides it, um, that come from the center. We looked at the project of, can you peel a carrot one-handed? The answer is yes. If you fix the peeler to the board, can color change a person's life? This was a care home project where people weren't eating. And as designers, we observed, we looked, and we realized when you put white food on a white plate, as on the left of the screen, people can't see it. Put the food on the blue plate, and some people gained back 25% of their body weight within a month. Can you create a care home bed that rivals the first class cabin on an aircraft? The answer is yes, and here it is. You, um, it's the same footprint as a normal care home bed. It's, the prototype is in Hong Kong. Do contact me if you want to know more about this. 
can you co-design an inclusive chat bot? Now, most chat bots look like these um, illustrations on the right. 25 year old, slightly subservient blonde women. Why? I believe it's because most, of, most chat bots are designed by 12, 25 year old men who just designed themselves a girlfriend. We worked with a group of accountants and management consultants who said this is what they want to be a chatbot. Dame Judi Dench or David Attenborough, an older, wiser friend who's seen something of life and can support them. Can artificial intelligence help prevent suicide? You know, this is technology and inclusivity at its most extreme. This is the River Foyle in the city of Derry in Ireland. And these little pods, which act as shops or community hubs, have, are they AI enabled? And they can interact with a tourist if someone asks, where can I get a good pint of Guinness? I'm told these guys are from Florida because of the length of this guy's socks. But one of the most important thing is that the pods, the city itself can reach out and ask someone in crisis on the riverbank just reach out to them and ask that all important human question, are you okay? And in trials, we're seeing some really positive results with this technology. This is the bridge over the river. It's nine stories high. It's a place where people go to um, jump off. But what if you were to enable it with a light installation that was technology enabled so it could change according to mood, function, season, and be controlled by the community. And this is what it would look like. It would become one of Europe's largest urban installations and turn to place where people go to end their life into a place where people go to celebrate life, a real power of inclusive tech. So you design for the margins and you get the mainstream. And when we think of people with disabilities, older people, they're actually pathfinders in technology. You know, if you think of how artificial intelligence can support people with dementia or cognitive overload or mixed reality can support the low vision community, this is tech as, at its best. And people of different ages and abilities are the pathfinders for us designing tech and creating tech. Get it right for them and you get it right for everyone. When we think about interfaces and paranoia, this is a design team. There's only one designer and she's in the middle. The rest are clinicians. And this is a project we did with King's College, London. And it was designing an interface which would help you slow down for a moment, hence the name slow-mo. And it's for people with paranoid thoughts. We got it wrong. It's actually not just for people who suffer from paranoid thoughts. It's for everyone who's ever felt stress. UX in a critical space. We're all talking about ICUs, ITUs. And the, we spent two years observing and being in, in hospitals where you see the whole gamut of life, the whole spectrum from birth to marriage to death in these places. Using inclusive design, we didn't design anything. We asked the clinicians to. What they needed was a system which could tell them where each patient was within the patient process. And this is called patient flow. So it's a simple traffic light system and it would look like this on the ward, either with a digital whiteboard or a physical whiteboard. So at a glance, clinicians can use technology to see where their patients are and how they're doing. Sort of getting to the end of this, you know, work with real people. And here are our designers actually working with real people. Um, you know, the gentleman on the right is a project with Panasonic, and he's doing yoga with this older woman in the park to understand her attitude to health. And on the left is our youngest ever participant for a project with Samsung. He's a little boy in the, in the blue cap. He's two years old, and he's talking about communities. Don't work with fake people. If you go onto Google, and you see Krista, I did, did mention Google there. Um, if you go onto Google and you type in personas, this is what you get, fake people. All of them are smiling. So if you see too many teeth in a presentation, walk away, it's fake. Um, there's 7.6 billion people on the planet. Go and find a real person to talk to. Do not make up one.
let your creative self shine and bring balance. And I really want to end with this. It's important that what's within you, your creativity, whether you're a designer or not, creativity is an intrinsic human value and that can bring the world into balance. Here is a shot of Chinese fashion designers and fashion marketers on an inclusive design course where they're actually just getting in touch with their inner creativity. It's important that you do actually start. I have a Instagram called Life's Whispers where I write little philosophies. And flying into Singapore, I saw this little boat making the most beautiful patterns on the water. And it was so small next to the big ships that were sitting out there. And I realized that even a small boat makes big ripples. And that was me. I feel like a small boat many times. And that is you. But launch yourself on the water and make a ripple. As well as creativity, you also need empathy and you need clarity. We talk about this in a, in a, um, a, a research that is really personal to me that's called creative leadership. And do reach out if you want to know more. So I wanted to end with this quote, because in this world, we've seen a lot of imbalance due to power, due to grabbing, due to people wanting a position. But inclusive design is about empathy. And another word for empathy is love. My mother gave me this poem when I was 14, and it's really been a part of my life. And I know she's on the call listening, so I have to be careful what I say here. <laughs> Tagore, India's poet, poet laureate, said, Power said to the world, you are mine. And she imprisoned him on her throne. Love said to the world, I am yours. And she gave him the freedom of her house. So even though you may just have the freedom of your house at the moment, that is still a freedom. And there is freedom of mind, there is freedom of heart, and there is freedom of hand. And I think that is the power of inclusive design, to be inclusive and to be expansive. So the final slide is just some ways of getting in touch um, with me. There is my name and there is the Life Whispers Instagram and there is our website. I hope that's a potted introduction of what you will hear at Inclusive Africa and a little groundwork for Christopher and Bernard on inclusive design. Fantastic, thank you so much. Um, uh, I think one thing that's really important to note is that inclusive design is about people. So even if we wanted to, talk, to have a theme on digital accessibility as we go, we had to start first with inclusive design because you cannot talk about digital accessibility if you're not talking about inclusive design but at the same time i think it's been very clear that people need to understand that inclusive design is about people and it covers everyone including people with temporary illnesses people who are elderly people with multiple languages or different ages or different cultures so thank you so much rama uh, for sharing with us next we're going to have christopher hello um can can I have access to the to share, please? Just trying to sort it. Thank you. You're giving away my story. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, sorry, I don't mean to. Um, it's not coming up as an option. It says I cannot share the screen while other participants are sharing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hang on. Uh, Irene, yeah. could you bring Raphael on the screen, please? Oh. Christopher, Christopher, you may just have to say next slide. I'm sorry. You, you're not coming up. It's not coming up as an option. Okay, then let's next slide, please. Is, is Raphael on? Okay, good, great. Okay, you ready? Uh, uh, yes, let's get see? started. Yep. I can see, I just can't control. So next yeah. slide, okay. please. Okay, yep. Sorry.
Can we go back Christopher. one? Oh, sorry. If that, that was more than, well, back one more, please. Oh, stop, perfect. Hello, uh, hello again, my name is Christopher. I didn't want to introduce myself before because I wanted to, in to introduce myself now and, and have this be part of the conversation of how I got, how I work with accessibility. So I started off as a failed musician. I have a degree in music and I had the epiphany in my mid twenties that I was never going to have the musical career that I wanted. I just so happened to be living in Cupertino and was fortunate enough to get a job at Apple. So in my career, I've spent 10 years at Apple doing hardware and software. I then went to Sony Ericsson and made phones for a couple of years. And even went to Disney Mobile and made games for a year. Next slide, please. And then I had the opportunity to come to Google. As of today, I've been at Google for eight years. Today is my official Googleversary, which is what we call it. It's like, a, like an anniversary, but for being at Google. So today is my eighth Googleversary. And I'm so pleased to be here. Um, I am on my fourth team. So today I am the head of accessibility programs for Google. But this is not my first job. This is my fourth. My first was making data center hardware. My second was in Google Play Music. My third was in Daydream, our AR and VR platform. Next slide, please. But it was in Google Play Music where I discovered accessibility. Next slide, please. I got what was called buttonholed. And what happened is I was leading my test meeting with uh, our, our testers and uh, one of the accessibility engineers came in, turned on voiceover, grabbed her iPhone, and I heard button, 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 button. And I asked, well, what's that? And she said, well, this is, this is Google Play Music for someone who's blind. And I literally said, well, that's stupid. How do they use it? And then she smiled and said, that's why I'm here. And that was the perfect answer because it taught me that I didn't know what I was talking about. And it, it, was, an, it was an open invitation to learn more. Next slide, please. So today, from that moment on, two months later, I became the lead of accessibility for Google Play. When I went into Daydream, I tried to bring accessibility into, into VR and AR. It was too early at the time. But then I got the opportunity to, to found the team of technical program managers to make all of Google's products inclusive, all of Google's products accessible. And at the same time, I also started mentoring people of color and I'm really pleased that I've learned so much about myself and so much about the people around me. I've actually been mentoring people from Zimbabwe and from Nigeria and even Haiti. In fact, I joked, I, I, I joked that I don't, didn't know any African-Americans at, at Google. I only knew Africans. So I'm really excited to be at a point now where I can learn more about different cultures, different languages, and, and, and even different musicians. Um, I, I was hoping to learn more about Ayubo Ogada when we came, but next time. So my mission is to make the world a better place. And by working at Google, I'm honored to have the opportunity to impact people at a scale not possible anywhere else. Next slide, please. And then next, next, or one more next. Thank you. So why build for inclusion? Well, simply it matters. There, you have the opportunity to impact a lot of people. There are 1 billion people in the world with some form of disability. And if you take a look at the vector in terms of hearing loss, uh, there, there is expected to be 900 million people by 2050 to have, have disabling hearing loss. And to bring this even closer to home, this is not something that you, are born, you have to be born with. 80% of the disabilities are acquired between the ages of 18 to 64 when, when, you're, when you should be schooling or working. Next slide, please. And also disability affects everyone, literally. So of the 1 billion people I mentioned a moment ago, these are the people who are self-identified. Self then there are people who recognize it, but they don't identify it amongst themselves. Then you have their friends and family, but then when you expand it out even more, you would take this Venn diagram and bring it out even farther, because everyone in the world is impacted through a situational or temporary disability, everything from 
the bright sun on your screen of your cell phone, or if you're walking into, into, into the house with a bag of groceries, you're, you're, you're temporarily one-armed. And it was important for technology to work for all of you all of the time. Next slide, please. And finally, it's also good for business. Um, we, we can't always do what we think is more really right. Sometimes you have to make a buck. And, and there is opportunity here, there as well. According to the Global Economics Disability Report, there are $8 trillion at stake. That's real money. And, and these are the friends and family of people with disabilities. Then there's also the impact to the brand. 87% of people will purchase a product because a company advocated for an issue that they cared about. And you look at these millennials with the avocado toast, they expect companies to make a com public commitment to corporate citizenship. So if you do the right thing for your company and they do the right thing for your brand, these things will come back to you. Next slide, please. So how to build for accessibility. There are three, next slide, please. There are three principles that we normally use inside Google or and three principles I want to share with everyone in terms of building products for people other than yourself, whether it's for ability or, or race or culture, they all matter. One thing is you want to leverage your strengths. I strongly recommend you build on the experience you have. You build on the technology you understand. You don't want to have to learn about a technology just because you have a great idea and then also learn about someone who is not you. You need to bring something to it that is core and powerful in yourself. Next slide. Never about us without us. You also want to design, and this leads into our very strongly into what Rama was talking about. You need to lean into the design and the experience and the worldview of people that you're working with. Um, I can't count how many ASL gloves I've seen in the world where people say, I'm going to solve deafness and I'm going to use technology and you'll never have a problem communicating again. The problem is the people who are making these kinds of ASL gloves were people who didn't really know a lot of deaf people. So you want to involve people and learn from people who you were trying to support. Mm -hmm. Next slide. And also, it's really important to that you, if you have a broad idea, you want to make sure you solve one problem or one person's problem. So if you have an idea and you meet one person's problem so deeply, then you broaden it out. This is sort of the converse of what Rama says, you design for the edges and you come into the middle. But you need to make sure that you solve a problem for that person at the edge properly and fully mm -hmm. before you bring it into the middle. Because if you don't solve the problem, you're never really gonna solve the problem of, 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 of the mainstream user. Next slide, please. So I'd like to show you one deep dive into a, a technology. And then given the, the space that we're on with, with COVID, I'm gonna just quickly talk about some of the products that we have and, and, and some of the accessibility functions there. Next slide, please. So first, and the deep dive is Live Transcribe. Next slide. So Live Transcribe is an application that exists on Android devices. It allows you to act, literally transcribe any conversation that you're having using your phone. And it works with over 70 languages. And many people who can't hear also can't speak. So we actually all have the ability for you to, to, to type your words. So you can actually have a conversation with a person back and forth. What's neat about this technology is that it's also been released into our Google Translate. So you actually now can have a multilingual conversation back and forth. So this technology was designed to solve a problem. Google is really so, so taking each of the three, the three concepts. You leverage your strengths. Google is, is, is renowned for our artificial intelligence and speech to text. You also want to start, you also want to, um, <coughs> I've lost track in terms of my notes, sorry. Because I'm not driving. So you want, you want to make sure that you never, never bought us without us. We did a lot of designing and testing with people in, of the community and then start with one. We solved one problem, we worked with one person and broadened it out to make sure it met the needs of folks. Next slide, please. Can we uh, play one, actually, looking at the time, I'm not gonna skip, I'm gonna skip this video so we have time for questions at the end, but I would recommend that anyone who wants to learn more about this, look up Live Transcribe on YouTube and learn about Dimitri. Dimitri is, this, is this research, the deaf research scientist whose life ambition was to use technology to communicate and live transcribe is his, is, is his baby. 
he, he helped build it. He helped, he helped build the technology and it was built so a friend of his could play chess with him. So that's the concept of start with one. Next slide, please. So now moving in towards more general accessibility of products that we have at Google. And again, with COVID as, as, as a backdrop, I wanted to be, share, to be able to share what we're doing so people know what you can access with all of the working from home, all of the schools at home, people don't know what, what works. So this is just an uh, opportunity for me to go through a couple of our products in G Suite, things that are relevant to education, especially in working from home. And I can share some of the accessibility things here. All of the work here was designed with the principles of leveraging your strength and never got us without us. Next slide. First is Google Meet. This is our video conference solution. I've had problems with Zoom because I'm not allowed to use Zoom. I usually use Google Meet. And one nice thing about Google Meet is it has built-in captions. The captions and Google Meet as of Monday will be free to anyone with a Gmail account. And the captions, although English only today, we would, I would expect to see more languages happening over time. But here's, here's something that allows us to communicate, connect, and with, with, with ASR captions, you don't need to worry about whether the person on the other side can hear. Next slide. In terms of, in terms of G Suite, um, you can edit documents with a screen reader. You can collaborate and comment on documents with a screen reader. You can even use your Braille display to, to edit docs. You can type with your voice and you can mani manipulate the whole UI with, with keyboard shortcuts. Next slide. In terms of, of Google Sheets, this is our version. This is our spreadsheet client. Um, you can edit spreadsheets with a screen reader. You can collaborate and comment with the screen reader. And you can also use keyboard shortcuts. Next slide. On Google Slides, and most of the slides we have here, we're using Google Slides. You can edit presentations with a screen reader. You can collaborate and comment. You see the pattern. We're trying to make, you can, we were trying to make sure you can do everything you can with, when you see with a screen reader to, to, be, to make it much more inclusive. So you can edit, collaborate, and comment with the screen readers. You can use a Braille display to edit. You can present slide with captions. So even if you're using a technology that doesn't have captions and you're using Google Slides, you can actually use the slides and use the, the captions in slides by itself. You don't have to have meet. You can use this by itself. And then you can also make, you can also mark up your document or presentation to make it accessible. Each one of these things I've described, just see the, the line at the bottom says getting started. We actually have some really thorough and deep help articles on Google about how to use these technologies. Next slide. And in addition to G Suite, there's some other things you might have heard of from Google like Android or YouTube or Chrome. All of these products are also inclusive. So if you want to use it, you should be able to because we've, we've taken the time and effort to make sure that our technologies are, are accessible using, next slide, the, the, the three principles of leveraging your strengths, do what you do well, never about us without us, design, test, and, 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 and co-collaborate with people who are not like you, and then start with one, solve that problem, and then bring it through. Next slide. Asante Nisana, thank you. All right, thank you so much, Christopher, for taking us through uh, some of the Google products. I think one conversation that's been uh, interesting to me, especially because of COVID, people trying to settle down and um, mainly get into the education piece, but also employment is about using all these different platforms that people have been forced to use. And just discovering that one, either they're not accessible or if they're accessible, they don't know how to use them. So we do appreciate that because most, a number of countries in Africa have picked up either Google or other products to use. So we'll definitely be, we'll be sharing some resources so that people can know at least if a product is accessible, where can you find the accessibility features. So thank you so much for walking us through that and for helping us know that actually accessibility is a learning process. Even us who've been in the industry for quite some time, every day we are still learning something new from someone else. So Thank you for, for this time. Um, I'll hand over to Bernard so that he can take us through the last part of the webinar. Uh, thank you, Irene. And if you allow me, I'm going to share my screen so that I can use, uh, scroll uh, the slides on my desk. So I'll just take a second to do that, if you allow me. 
Um, I think I need to be given permission to do that from your end. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it doesn't seem to be wanting to let you do that, uh, Bernard. Um, okay. I'm, I'm sorry about that. Um, have you requested it? Okay. Did you request it? Uh, no, you? I didn't. Okay. So um, I, told me, but it's fine. So, um, <clears throat> if you hand me the controls, I will then just use what we have. Yeah, you have the control. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much. So, yes. So as I introduce myself, um, uh, my name is Bernard, and uh, I work with the Global Disability Innovation Hub. Um, and together with AMREF here in Kenya, we are running uh, Innovate Now, which is the first, uh, is, is the first uh, accelerator program in Africa focusing on uh, innovating for disability. And I wanna begin my presentation with a little reflection about my experience with inclusive design and particularly uh, in the area of education. Um, if it allows to move to the next slide. I don't seem to be, okay, there we go. Oh, uh, slide. Um, yeah, so, you, so I was wanna... born, sorry. Sorry, Ben. Uh, do you just want to say next slide, and I'll um, I'll I'll click for you. Okay, that works. So I was born in rural Kenya. So previous slide, please. Um, and when I was born, I was diagnosed with uh, osteogenesis imperfecta at the age of two weeks. And from that time to when I was a teenager, I experienced uh, recurrent fractures. Uh, um, in my right femur. And because of that, it was very difficult for me to get into school. Uh, if we could have someone mute, I think there's someone talking in the background. Um, yeah, so um, it was very difficult to get into schools. And I remember I was rejected right from the beginning. I couldn't get into kindergarten. And every school we tried, and my parents tried more than uh, 10 schools. And eventually I had to go to a special school uh, where I went to boarding school from kindergarten um, to primary school. One of the effects of that in my life is uh, people tell me that I, I, I am never homesick, but I guess it's because I was away for too long. But my point here is despite all these barriers, I was able not only to go to kindergarten and high school, but to access some of the best um, university education here in Kenya and, and globally. I have been privileged to study in Strathmore University as well as Stanford. Next slide, please. So my, this, this statement is actually the backdrop of my, my, my talk. And um, it's about moving from mindset to asset. And Africa needs uh, now to invest first time more strategically uh, in creating equal opportunities for persons with disabilities. Now we'll explain why. Next slide, please. So where do we need inclusive design? Um, inclusive design is needed everywhere, to be honest in every aspect of Banand? I think there's some background um, interference. Mm -hmm. I'm sure it would be just a moment. Uh, sorry, guys, I had a small interference with kids. I am also parenting three kids while trying to work from home. So I will resume my talk. 
And I was talking about where do we need inclusive design? And it is in every aspect of uh, society as it were. But uh, this circles or clusters, as you may see, they touch on um, basically basic services that everyone needs. So from healthcare to housing, to public transport, to education, to access to information and digital infrastructure. And I will pick on a few of this and just explain the situation in Kenya as a reflection of what is happening in Africa and how we can move um, from, from here. Next slide, please. So let's look at education. So um, in most schools, uh, this is a situation. Most persons with disabilities in Kenya, in Africa, go to special schools. And their counterpart children who have no disabilities, they interact with persons with disability, maybe in other so so social circles. So as a child going to regular school, this is their dream. They want their friends to be able to go the same school as them. Next slide, please. So, so African countries can actually overcome one of the biggest barriers, I believe, which is mindset and stigma discrimination by investing in education and training on disability inclusion um, in mainstream education uh, across public and private sector. Next slide, please. So this picture is um, in very few words, uh, uh, an expression of what it takes to move from point A to B for um, uh, any person with disability uh, that does not have private means. We have one of the most, um, I would say, uh, dynamic transport uh, systems. We are famous for traffic jams, but we're also famous for inaccessibility. So public transport in Africa can be reimagined to accommodate persons with disability. Next slide, please. So it is possible to actually prioritize and make accessible adjustments to the current system while investing in accessible designs for future uh, public transport and uh, public infrastructure systems. But I actually want to emphasize here that you know we need to strengthen the laws and the enforcement of the same for the public transport and construction sector to safeguard inclusive design in Africa. And I also believe this is the time to introduce inclusive design standards uh, in all new infrastructure projects. Next slide, please. So when it comes to work and employment, this is a dream of every person with disability to be able to access dignified work and to be able to access um, assistive technologies that can enable them to perform. Unfortunately, the compounding effects of poverty and lack of access to assistive technologies deny persons with disability this opportunity. Next slide, please. So this is some data from the World Bank and 50 to 75% percent, uh, uh, persons with disability are 50 to 75 percent chances less likely to get jobs. Um, and some of the issues here are compounded by lower literacy levels among persons with disability, uh, fewer opportunities for higher education, and fewer opportunities to nurture uh, and obtain digital skills and soft skills that are in high demand in the current and future labor markets. Next slide, please. So what can Kenya and other African countries do to increase job opportunities for persons with disabilities? So I actually believe that it is time to invest not only in the primary and vocational training where most of the support for persons with disability in terms of education goes, but to go to a, a, a notch higher and look at tertiary and higher education, to look at talent and digital skills development 
uh, among persons with disability. I also believe that Africa needs to strengthen their laws around social protections and systems so that this social protection can have a bigger impact to transit or help persons with disability transition from abject poverty uh, to better quality life. And I actually believe that enforcement of labor laws and other laws relating to disability, like the UN Convention uh, for the Rights of Persons with Disability, where we have more than 177 um, countries globally signing this global treaty, and Africa and Kenya actually is among one of the signatories to this. And I believe we need to increase access uh, to, invest, to assistive technology by investing more in programs that can help uh, this uh, devices and technologies become uh, more accessible. And finally, and I'm very passionate about this point, it's really about helping people to understand, especially employers, that the business case of inclusion uh, and, and disability mainstreaming actually exists and makes business uh, more better for everyone. Next slide, please. So this is some data around uh, persons with disability and access to mobile. Um, so we all know the, the role that the digital infrastructure plays um, in our current economies. Uh, if you look at Kenya, and, and you know Kenya is one of the countries in Africa leading a digital revolution based out of the mobile or access to mobile phones. But persons with disabilities actually are 12% less likely to own a mobile device than persons with no disabilities. This is research coming out of GSMA. And ownership and, and, and access to mobile devices is going to be important um, in, in the current economy. Next slide, please. So, what, what are some of the issues around mobile and, and why is it important? So when you look at mobile in Africa, a lot of services, uh, and these are social good services like mobile money transfer, access to healthcare um, systems, uh, social protection funds, disbursements, they are all being done over the mobile device. But when you look at how most of the systems are designed and implemented, there is very little attention to universal design. And most apps and websites in, in, in government services and public uh, services are actually not designed for accessibility. Next slide, please. Next slide. So this is a, a quote that I would love to share with all, all of you. And this is a lady who, uh, um, for me is a role model for the entire uh, disability community and even the world at large. And she talks about the barriers that exist um, and that disability is not something people need to overcome, but it's up to us to uh, break uh, or get rid of the barriers that prevent persons with disabilities from thriving. And inclusive design is at the center of this um, uh, action. Next slide, please. So I cannot overemphasize the role of assistive technologies in um, making the world a more accessible place for persons with disability. And this uh, diagram here just shows how complex, how a complex interplay of economic, social, and political factors create barriers to assistive technology. So we need to invest in better policies as a continent, and we need to look at provision of assistive technology. Uh, we also need to look at the products themselves and the people that are providing this. Next slide, please. So at the Global Disability Innovation Hub, we've done a lot of research to understand what are the complexities around 
making assistive technologies um, possible and accessible uh, in Africa. And one of the things we found out is that we need a collaborative innovation as most assistive technologies is designed and, the, and sold by large companies. But when you come to African countries like Kenya, some of these solutions developed from outside, they don't really meet the need. They are not, not robust enough, they break, and they're expensive. So because of this, we have launched a global partnership called Assistive Technology 2030. And part of this partnership is Africa's first assistive technology accelerator and inclusive innovation ecosystem. And we have a mission to reach at least 3 million people with affordable and quality assistive technologies. And how are we doing this? So we are working or opening the doors to designers, to startups, to actually think about African problems and, uh, and African uh, solutions to assistive technologies. And the support that we want to provide to them or what we are providing to them is actually designing with the end users in mind. So we are trying to build a network of persons with disability that want to be part of solution development for assistive technologies in Africa. We are calling it the Assistive Technology Live Lab. We also want to test and validate sustainable and scalable business models for delivering assistive technology in Africa. And finally, we want to create access to resources and partnerships that can help uh, assistive technology ventures in Africa validate and grow and to help them navigate uh, successfully through what is popularly known as the startup value of death, which is a stage where you're not profitable, but you're trying to design and to validate um, a solution that works. Next slide, please. And I wanted to let you know about what you've done so far. We launched on the 3rd of December last year, uh, our first cohort, and we're supporting five Kenyan-based assistive te technology startups that are providing solutions across electric wheelchairs built and made for Africa, navigation and mobility aid for persons with disability. In the midst of this pandemic, we are about to launch our next cohort, and it's primarily going to focus on mobile and assistive technology. And we see a great role of mobile in helping persons with disability, especially in these times of pandemic, even to access information and we'll be inviting innovators, designers, and entrepreneurs to build solutions. Next slide, please. Thank you very much. And I'm happy to take your questions. Yeah. So quickly, uh, I want to mention we've actually run out of time. Uh, and we're going to take another 10 minutes to answer three questions. Each speaker will get one question. So we will understand if some people have to drop off but uh, just to give people a chance at least to ask their questions. So my first question actually goes to, um, uh, to Rama. Uh, how much accountability do you feel we need to take as designers in terms of the unintended consequences of, the, of, of our solutions, especially when it has been deployed in the real world? A great question. I think, um, the simple answer is as much as possible, as much as you can foresee and um, as much as you can. People will always use things in ways that you don't intend or you don't see. You know, a chair can be something, we design it to sit on, but it can be an art object, a ladder. It can be a weapon. Um, it can be, um, you know, something very dangerous if you, if you throw it out the window of a tall building. So I think there's not, if you are the designer of a chair that was used as a weapon, um, you may need to think about what was it about that chair, the chair that weaponized it? Was it um, a cultural, an aesthetic, or an, an, a human association? Um, so I think the, the simple rule of thumb is, as a designer is that you take responsibility for the things you, you create. Um, 
as much as possible and within reason. If you start off with that intention within you though, so this is the important answer. I gave you a sort of politicians or semi-legal answer <laughs> before. But the important answer is whatever you intend will come out in your designs. So make sure your intention is right and the positivity of your actions and your ideas will follow. If you also include real people in your designs to give feedback, then they will tell you what's wrong. If you have a fake persona, they will never tell you that you're wrong. They will like everything that you've done because you've made them up as a person. So that litmus test of developing it with real people and real people with real needs will also ensure that you get your designs right. Okay, great. Thank you so much. The next question is actually for Bernard. And what I loved about Bernard's discussion is that he actually brought this discussion home to Africa. So what, uh, Bernard, this is for you. One of our major problems in Africa is a strong network to maximize the available software and applications. How do we overcome this? Yeah, so thanks for that question. And I think um, the way I see it, it's, I can look it from, I can look at it from two perspectives. In terms of building networks, so one of the things that makes uh, universal design or inclusive design very attractive is that it's a global topic and it's not, it's not just relevant uh, in one region. It's actually a global conversation. And because of this, we've actually started to see global networks forming to actually make solutions uh, accessible for persons with disability. And one of the examples I can give is actually the 80-20-30 um, partnership, which is trying to bring together um, a global uh, network of um, experts around disability and hopefully inspire others to do the same so that we can deliver universal solutions. Uh, from a software perspective, um, I would look at it like this. We have a lot of talent in Africa, you know. We have some of the most recognized innovations in the world, like M-Pesa. And I believe a time has come for us to show value for our African developers and innovators to also build solutions for persons with disability. And I also believe we don't have to reinvent the wheel. I think we can leverage on technology, for example, coming from companies like Google that have made it their mission to be inclusive. We can also leverage on technologies that are open source, um, that provide the same level of functionality to most um, proprietary software. And I believe being in these networks is, is important. I think I love what Enable is doing. And I think um, it's upon us to actually plug in into these initial programs that have started this journey of making Africa inclusive. Thank you. Okay, fantastic. Um, the last question is for Christopher. It's a bit technical, but uh, in many countries, speech to text technology is challenging due to accents and dialects locally. What is live transcribed accuracy uh, on non-English speech and how does the, what algorithms does it adapt to? There is a lot of factors that Im impact the, the efficacy of, of a specific speech to text engine. For example, how noisy it is in the area. So there's, that's one factor you can't control for a lot. But culture inclusivity is, is an important part of this because People will speak English in, in many different ways. Heck, even here inside the U.S., people speak English in many, many different ways. It's, it's not just accent, but it's also colloquial expressions. There's lots of things that have to do with communication more than just the words that's spoken, but it's how it's spoken. Um, I can't go into specifics in terms of what algorithms that we're using, but I can say I know that this is something that we are working to do better on because there are also ways of communicating more than just spoken words. There's a project that we have called Project Euphonia, that was announced last year. And what this is, it, it, it is an attempt to try to accommodate people who have non-typical speech patterns. Um, Dimitri, who, who was the, the, one of the, the founders of the live transcribe application, he is both deaf and Russian. 
and he taught himself English by phonetic sounds, but he couldn't even hear them. So his experience speaking into live transcribe the default applications is kind of tough. So there's many reasons why it would be hard, but with this project, with this project Euphonia, we are broadening the, the voice models so that we can accommodate people with non-typical speech patterns like the deaf accent or uh, someone who has a, a, a Down syndrome accent. It is, it is just different enough that it causes problems. And then there's the cultural accents to it. So this is a, a broad problem and it's not just about how you speak, but it's also how you speak in terms of culture, but also how you speak physically. And we are working to try to make all of this better. I hope that was enough of an answer, but also. <laughs> no, it's pretty good, pretty good. Thank you. Yeah. So that's the end of our Q&A session. So we do appreciate your, we've got several questions, but we cannot get to all of them uh, because of time. So I want to say a very, very special thank you to our speakers. I'm sure you've inspired uh, today's audience to be more inclusive. And for, um, in terms of information, we will share some information about our speakers so that you can be able to connect with them directly. At the same time to our participants, the one thing I would love for you to take from this conversation is that design is about people. If you focus on making design about people, you will succeed and you will be more inclusive. So our next um, webinar will be on May 21st and the focus of our May 21st um, uh, webinar is actually is on digital accessibility. You'll get to discuss what digital accessibility really means and we'll actually have um, the two founders of the Global Accessibility Awareness Day as part of uh, our panel. So I want to thank you all for participating today and we will share a recording of, the, of today's webinar. Uh, for, uh, for everyone. So thank you so much and you all have a wonderful evening, morning, night, everything. You can mention it. So thank you. Thanks to you all. <laughs>